Welcome to Home Business TV. Welcome to the Home Business Podcast. I'm Richard Henderson, your host. We love entrepreneur success stories, and who better than Melissa Cor Caballo? She is a dynamic force behind Dead Horse Branding, a groundbreaking agency revolutionizing the music and entertainment industry. Melissa's journey from humble beginnings to leading female entrepreneur in the branding world is nothing short of inspiring. Melissa Corcabaya, how's it going today? Hi, it's good. How are you doing? Good. Thanks for uh, <laughs> connecting in. I guess you're connecting in today from uh, Nashville. From Nashville, that's right. Not from Australia. Yeah, I do. I detect a uh, a little bit of a down under accent do you work do you still work at all at, um from um australia or just where you were from earlier <clears throat> no absolutely we have aussie clients on our roster um and then we do go home for uh, several months out of the year we try to mm -hmm. escape the nashville winter um oh. and work with our clients down there what uh what part of australia uh, so a couple of hours south of Sydney is where we're from and where we have a base, but technically we're in the Sydney region. Beautiful country. Got over there a couple of times with the Navy and uh, never got a oh, chance wow. to go back. <laughs> oh. Long trip, but uh, <laughs> well, it's long, long trip, but it was worth it. <laughs> yeah, it, it is long. And I feel like it gets longer and longer every year when it, I feel like it should be the opposite. But mm -hmm. maybe, maybe it's the island is drifting more. <laughs> There we oh, go. Wait. What do they call that? Teutonic <laughs> plates or something? <laughs> Teutonic plates? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, they're definitely moving. Well, Melissa, thanks for um, joining us today. Melissa is an expert in the mar in the marketing areas such as branding your business, and she'll share some of that advice with us today. Melissa founded Dead Horse Branding and under five years transformed it from startup to multi-million dollar company. Her roster of clients includes music producer Tony Brown, Universal Music Group, Sony Music, and Warner Music. Melissa has worked with renowned brands such as HDTV, TEDx, and Lionsgate Entertainment. Anything I missed <laughs> in that group, <laughs> Ryan. Can you share a little more with us about your uh, exciting entrepreneur journey? Yeah, that, that's an interesting way of putting it. Exciting entrepreneurship journey. Um, I'd be more, more inclined to say hard hard journey um because it is right you know that saying there's that old saying that says entrepreneurs will you know will not work 40 hours a week to basically work 90 hours a week for themselves so like they rather work 90 hours a week for themselves to avoid to work 40 hours for someone else so it's an oxymoron right it's kind of stupid and even my friends are like don't you own your own business why why aren't you having any time off and yeah, so I haven't talked to it. I haven't talked to an entrepreneur yet who isn't burning the midnight oil. <laughs> yeah. Look, you you just you just have to, and and but then but then it does it does uh, lend the question, or it does put a spotlight on the question: well, Why, if you're working so much harder, um, and you you you're not getting that time off you want or you need, you know, why why would you do it? Um, and for me, the answer is it comes in ebbs and flows, right? It comes in ebbs and flows. So that entrepreneurial spirit is definitely not something that sort of hits you one day and you kind of just decide to do it. It's a burning sensation that you have mm -hmm. from uh, pretty early on usually. And even if it hits late, um, it's it's been burning and burning and and niggling at you for quite some time to where you just have to do it right. I like what you said and, about ebb and flow. Um, it it seems like more and more yeah. my life is ebb and flow, but I think that you know yeah. that that's part of the entrepreneurial world. Also, there's good points, uh, there's low points, mm -hmm. and you have to um, getting have back to, to those good all. points makes it worthwhile and all the time you spend. I don't know. Yeah, and you'll hear a lot of entrepreneurs say why they got out of being an entrepreneur is because they just got sick of trying to find the money every month, trying to find the money every week. Like that's a job within itself, right? Bringing in the funds and making sure that cash flow is there. 
you know, and the overhead is covered is, is a, it's a full-time job in itself. Then you've got the job of running the team and the people, then you've got the job of doing the job for the client. So it does again, really come down to why, <laughs> why, <laughs> why would, you, why would you choose that as opposed to just go to work, have your paycheck, go home, whatever. Um, but for me, it's, it's, it's sort of, it's a bit bigger than that. You know, I actually got fired for being too entrepreneurial in Nashville. My first record label job at 25, 24. And that's um, probably a big motivator getting fired, you know, kind of like you kind of <laughs> take a look at things or in, in, do some analysis. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm that restless soul. So I am a complete restless soul that never sort of, uh, being able to handle any kind of feeling that's being put over me. So I have a requirement in my uh, makeup to always try to crack another ceiling or crack another level. And that can be really difficult uh, at a corporation, at a company. You know, you, you are limited. You, you're limited in your job role. And they want you to, to conform you to, to whatever standard they have. Yeah. Yeah, and I can't say I've I've worked for a ton of different corporations and a ton of different companies, um, and I left school at a very young age, and I did go out on my own and start my own small companies back then, um, and I just learned very quickly that I was not good at conforming. I I wanted I wanted to be helping grow and make decisions and try this and try that, and my hands were always tied, and I felt extremely frustrated. So I think the me, saying was storming versus conforming. <laughs> I seem to there remember that one. That's a good one. Yeah, that's a good one. So for me, it was really about the fe flexibility of the mind and not feeling like a bird in a cage. And it didn't matter really what it took to do that. It didn't matter. It doesn't matter what it takes to be able, for me, to be able to free my mind right. and allow allow myself and allow the team around me and my business partner, who's my husband, to, you know, come up with the most drastic, crazy ideas and then try it. <laughs> you know, yeah, you've you got to, you got to remember those team members and, you know, even though you're driven and you have a focus, you've got to bring them in, even, even if they don't work for you, even if they're just, you know, a vendor or whatever, and, uh, you know, keep them contributing too. you know, are there any critical Absolutely. points that you look back on that were, that were important to attaining the success you have achieved? You know, it's that DH7 module. It's the seven branding formulas. That, that is what is critical to how Dead Horse even came about. And it's what's so critical in being an entrepreneur, a brand, a talent, an entity, or a product. So it did take us a while. It did take us a long while to figure out those formulas. And when I met my now husband, um, he had half of the formulas. I had half of the formulas. And it wasn't until we well, kind of marriage made in heaven. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, it wasn't until we realized that, oh, there's like a full system here. There's a full strategy and a, a full formula uh, that works when we get together. And we always laugh and joke because, you know, if Rick didn't work at the company, then we'd need like three people to fill his role. Right. Um, and then with me, it's a little bit the same. So that is what is critical. And what is needed. And that's why we're so passionate about, well, that's why we created the DH7 curriculum, the seven branding formulas. And that's why we've partnered with different universities and lecture at different universities to get mm -hmm. that key information back to the start where I wish we got it because it would have made that transition from career opportunity, uh, career wish list, uh, you know, everything you're learning right. at school for your career, it would have made that jump and leap so much easier um so yeah that i feel is absolutely critical but, to be, then to you also met your husband <laughs> so that uh yeah you know that that, that helped that's kind of a good turning point because you know it's all about balance as entrepreneurs and so now you're balancing personal mm -hmm. life and the brand if you can kind of mix the two together um, you know, my Oh yeah, some people think we're nuts. <laughs> some people absolutely think we're nuts. So you you work for yourself, then you work together. Mm -hmm. Um, that's hard. 
you know, and then everything else that comes around it. And, and we are definitely different. He is extremely creative. He is 100% creative. He, he knows business and he, he comes over the business side many times, but he is so, so, so creative where I'm a portion of creative. I wish I was more creative than I am. Um, but I'm a portion of it, but I'm definitely more on that that business sales strategy organization. But you got a good yin and a yang, as they say. You I mean you wouldn't want both of you yeah. experts in the same no. thing, then you'd have like a weak point mm -hmm. in the That's right. Well, everyone seems to love hardship stories. What were some of the tougher challenges you faced in building up your successful branding company? Yeah. And you know, hardship stories are great because everybody really does have such unique ones. And I think we have a unique one to the American culture because we're foreign. So some of the really big hardship stories are trying to stay in the country. It's not an easy process um, and it's an expensive one. So we were jumping from visa to visa to visa to visa. And basically every year we had to start compiling a portfolio of all our best accolades, how much money we're making, how much money we're not making um, basically giving reason to stay in the country every oh, okay. year. And it, it oh man, it, it was absolutely exhausting. We finally got our green card not long ago, and that was a long process. It should have been a lot quicker. But so, so both really of you are from Australia then? or Both, yes. Well, okay, all right. Yeah, yeah. And there was a, a, a period of time there where, you know, I um, – even I wasn't able to really work for the company. So I had to sort of take that step back and let the legal paperwork thing figure itself out. And, and that was really hard because, you know, we own property here, we have an American child. Um, and then, you know, we pay taxes and all of a sudden you're like, uh, what? I, huh? Okay. Yeah. And, you know, so massive sh hurdles, massive struggles. Right, it's probably pretty America. expensive and you got to get a, a special very. lawyer to file the paperwork. Very. And yeah. Yep. Huh. Very, very, very. So they're massive hardships. But I've got to say with every hardship comes, not for everyone, but for those that can push through it or for those that are determined enough, um, with every hardship can come great a great sense of tenacity and so for us it, it and for me it was I was just goal driven at that point like I didn't even know if I wanted the green card anymore I was that mm -hmm. exhausted but it just became a, I have set out to do this so I want it um and and it so was it actually great. that and process you know actually increased your tenacity and then you uh you know uh, appreciate yeah. the success more then you know absolutely and look it that like I almost wonder what's harder, building the company or getting a green card because they were both <laughs> as hard as each other. And without the company, you wouldn't have got the green card and da, 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 da. Um, you know, so they were huge hardships. And then like most home businesses, right, you, you start out usually from your home and you, you branch up and, and you decide what kind of external office you want. Um, and, and those are hardships. They're financial decisions to make. It's a lifestyle right. choice too, right? I never actually wanted a massive office downtown with 30 different employees. I learned very quickly that I like small teams. I like strong, aggressive small teams because the more people that come under my belt, the more monkeys I need to manage as opposed to right. doing the actual creative work. And I love managing people and I absolutely love helping them thrive. However, I don't want to manage people full time. I want people that can manage themselves and we can manage the bigger picture together. So there's some hardships you've got to sort of put forth and it all comes down to the strategy of the company and it all goes back to that work-life balance. What do you want? Mm -hmm. You know, where do you want to be in life? What kind of community do you want to be around? What kind of people do you want to be around? So for us, when COVID hit, um, I, would, I wouldn't say it was a blessing in any way. I don't think COVID was a blessing. Um, but what it did was it did actually reshift a little bit of our mindset because we were forced to let our external office go. Right. And as much as it was okay, the external office, like, again, 
my entrepreneurial spirit and the way that I work is if, if, if I want to sit on the back porch under the trees and get creative and write a press release because that's what I need in that moment, then I want to be able to do that and I want my staff to be able to do that. Um, I think for entrepreneurs and creatives, especially environmental factors are huge and sometimes I feel extremely comfortable at home doing bits and pieces and then I need to get out to a coffee shop. I need the hustle and bustle around me to actually like I feed off the energy. And so when we looked at establishing our office again, you know, we had a conversation with the staff and we put it to them as well and said like, what, what kind of work life balance do you want? Do you want to be in the office five days a week or are you happy with that semi remote, semi in person kind of lifestyle? And we all kind of agreed that that's what we like. Um, you know, we know we need to be together and we know that being face-to-face is a, a, a huge advantage. I don't think that could ever go away in any business or any team. Um, and there would be like having a long distance relationship with, with your partner. It, it, that's really mm-hmm. hard, right? So I like what we've established right now and what we've built and we've, uh, created a um we've created an environment for ourselves so we've we've built this uh kind of like a bit of what you see behind me this black barn dominium style concrete floors lots of glass lots of nature on a mm-hmm. couple of acres in Brentwood and um it's still fairly new and we're, we're still building it out but it feels good because we all chose it I think it seems like sound like having smaller teams manageable teams that get on board with your the with, with your you know work Mm-hmm. life balance and how you work between home base and office that it seems like that's been pivotal to your su- success is getting buy-in mm-hmm. from the teams uh, absolutely you know people need to have like-minded attitudes and like-minded passions um mm-hmm. and, and that and that doesn't matter where you work right and as a boss or a business owner you, you very quickly see people that you know may not be into it as much as they thought they were right you can kind of weed them out pretty quickly. Um, and that's unfortunate because so many people really haven't found their passion yet. Like by the time myself, I'm interviewing people in their mid to late twenties and you know, people that really should have an idea of where they want to go in life. You can tell it. Oh, you think. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, wow. Okay. Look, I, I hope, you know, maybe working here helps you figure it out or because we do so many formulas, Uh I hope it gives you the opportunity to go, I really want to go down this lane. But then I started realizing that I can't afford to do that. I can't afford to help everyone. Um, So we started to become very, very strict about like who comes in. Yeah, you got to kind of keep your your mission focused on the on the branding and, you know, personnel development is important, but you kind of don't want it to... uh, drive the bus. Well, I have to ask this question. You know, it seems like you're in a fun business. What's it like working with clientele that are, you know, primarily centered in the entertainment and music industry? It's so much fun. I mean, we get to work with fashion brands, musicians, producers, songwriters, publishers, um, you know, talent, excuse me, talent. We've worked with comedians. We've worked with other entrepreneurs that have built extremely successful businesses. So, our kind of motto is like we will get on board with anything that's cool, anything we understand and and cool within, you know, whatever that kind of means to us and making sure that we all fit that brand and that message as well. But entertainment, you know, it's entertainment or the entertainment industry to me is one of the biggest branding lanes they could possibly be. And we were talking about this the other day. We were saying how America is one of the most and, and well-branded countries in the world. Um, and when you think of America, you obviously think of that kind of American dream, no shelf, do what you want. You know, you're out there, you can give anything a go. Uh, but mm-hmm. most importantly, it's the spotlight. It's the celebrities. It's that fame. It's that lifestyle that America is so great at building themselves upon. And we always have a giggle because when we're doing a press campaign, for an Australian artist or an American artist, if they're doing press in America, you amp it up. The perception is huge. When you do press in Australia, for instance, if that if that artist is crossing over into that territory or vice versa, um, you have to kind of reword a lot of things in the Australian market and you need to bring the perception down. 
<laughs> um, because Australians don't. Here's the thing: we all buy into amazing things we can't have and things we want, right? We all, as as a human race, do that. But the Australian culture is very much built upon, you know, a tall poppy syndrome. If you get too big for your boots, kind of thing, we cut you down. Interesting. I right, said, so "There's mm-hmm. you actually have to, I guess, tailor Dumb things." It down. T- tailor I things to different uh, different countries. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah. it seems like branding is probably the, the the most important critical success factor for somebody who's in the entertainment industry. I guess I look at branding as what what do you think? What what bit what what picture comes to mind when you hear a different um, person in the entertainment industry or even a company? You know what 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 brand yeah. does that conjure up? And I think no nowhere is that mental image more important than in the uh, the branding world. Right. For me, when I hear the word branding, it, it, to me, it's straight visual. To some people, it's straight message, or to others, it's straight audio. Most of us are straight visual, right? Um, and what I love, another saying that they say in the music business is, "We listen with our eyes." It's true. Oh. Um, so to me, it's imagery that just comes in. And then it's, do I like it or do I not? Does it resonate with me? Do I stand with it or do I not? How does it move me? What kind of emotion does it give me? You know, and then you kind of go into it. So, you know, we work on, we'll use the music industry for an example because it's easy to understand. But, you know, if you've got a rock artist and they've got, extremely heavy music um the sound is heavy the message is is heavy everything is real right rock is is very emotional it can be very dark um it has its highs as well but it's it's very loud and then you've got all this kind of cross branding that might be florally and light and ethereal and you know i'm not saying you can't make cross pollinating worlds combined and look great you absolutely can when it's done right but if we're going off a visual and if i'm going to see something ethereal and something light and space you know i'm Mm -hmm. i'm going to assume it's something like an enya um i'm going to assume it's something in that tone and then i play it and it's heavy and it's dark i'm like "Whoa, whoa you've confused me and before i even try to delve or care to delve into it i'm out because I'm confused and we don't like to be confused, especially in the branding space. So what we pride ourselves on is every single one of those seven formulas has to align perfectly. And if we are going to do something contradictive like that in the branding space, where we are going to mix a medium of audio and visual, then we need to explain that very early on. So you don't come in for a shock because that's, what's extremely important. And then, that's what creates brand loyalty. We buy into something. We want to know that we're getting that every single time. It's okay to steer a little left and a little right, you know, and give me a bit of an edge. But if you completely take me somewhere else, you lose me. With the branding, it, it like reinforces a, a something positive. It, it, it has to conjure up a po- uh, uh, a, a positive well, what visual it, on what's being on what's being branded. It sounds like that's yeah. one of the more important things mm-hmm. with branding. Well, and maybe not even positive, just consistent. Consistent. A consistent message because it could be a negative message. Um, it could be an edgy message. Like it, it could be right. Um, it could be positive. It, it, it could be anything. But as long as it's consistency. And that is threaded through the whole brand. That is what creates branding. And that word is probably a word that's not used enough. Everybody thinks branding. They think authentic. It's like, okay. What, I think, what you, I think when you're looking at branding, I'm trying to like, why is consistency important? I bet what, so a critical point is that you don't want people confused when they think of a different, exactly. of a brand that if, if, it's, if there's different parts of it, then that starts getting confusing and it's not, it's not exactly. consistent. Um, yes. What do you think like about online? Um, everything, everything's going to online and online and now AI marketing. Is there any, anything in the online world that makes 
branding more important or makes makes it a bigger challenge to have a consistent message? It doesn't make it more challenging to have a consistent message, but it the online market makes it more important to have a strong, uh, continuous and fluid brand because now that everything is online, you're competing with so many more people. Before, there were only like X amount of channels. And again, I'll say a musician, there's only X amount of channels that you can hear the artist and see the artist. Right. Now you can hear and see through so many channels and it's absolutely wonderful for those independent artists to have that opportunity to compete with the the record label space. However, the branding is more important than ever because now there's just an influx of people and songs and messages and you know, it's gonna be a lot harder. It's gonna be harder. It's a it's a harder challenge. It's it's absolutely it's more competitive, but I wouldn't use the word harder because not every if you know how to brand yourself and how to create a great brand, then it's not hard. It's not right. Because not everybody knows how to do it. Maybe, maybe so it's hard maybe, in the implementation where you've got to figure out what channels you need to promote through, you know, to promote a brand through, um, with all the different yeah, channels. That can, mm-hmm, that can definitely, uh, that can definitely be hard to navigate with all the different channels. And most people just go, okay, I'll put them on everyone. Um, And that's usually what you would do. There's only a couple we might sometimes hold an artist back from. And again, depending on that strategy, but getting that brand consistency matters when you walk into Starbucks. It matters when you hang out with your friends on the weekend. It matters when you go into a songwriting um, session with someone. So, and again, so the way I look at it is you've got this social media influx, you've got this online influx, which is incredible to get to where you want to go. And if you know how to brand yourself, see the competition is in how to brand yourself, not in the online marketplace. If you know how to brand yourself, then you have a massive advantage over everyone. You know, there are still artists at record labels that are not branded correctly and they're kind of figuring it out as they, they go along. So imagine if you're independent, you come through tight, you come through really well put together um, then you're almost you could because you can get direct to that consumer yourself. You could you can overtake the record label uh, artists, and the proof of that is that's why people get signed off TikTok. I got to I got to ask this question. Yeah. So you're you're working through all this branding and trying to do it consistent and build this message, and I I can imagine I don't have to use any names, but I can imagine pe- clients in the entertainment music industry might be kind of you know, maybe headstrong or they've got their own view of how it should be. And uh, any, mm-hmm. any challenges there when you're, you know, working with maybe a larger ego and they might, they're not seeing it the way you, you want to bring them along. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Look, that it, it happens all the time and it happens in any space. And that's why the team you choose and the people you choose to work with is so important. But look, at the end of the day, it's always going to be the client's product. It's always going to be the talent's product. We are the vehicle to help tighten it up as much as possible and amplify it as loud as possible. But at any point, if they're not agreeing with something we're going to do, um, then usually we'll have a disclaimer that says, look, we kind of advise against this because we've seen this happen or this happen or this happen. But if you want to try it, we're here. We're going to stand behind you and give it everything that. Well, yeah, you got to go. You got to get get them to buy into it. And, mm-hmm. uh, and look, I think, I think just because, you know, until somebody can pinpoint and trademark how to go viral, I don't think any of us can sit here and say, we have all the answers every time. Um, that, that's not what we're about. Yes, we're experts in several of our seven fields. However, we're not stupid enough to think that there's no exception to the rule. There's a massive exception to the rule. Um, And you see those exceptions break every day. So we always still want to give that that client of ours that space to to not feel like they shouldn't have a say or an idea. And, I mean, sometimes that's when some of the best magic is made. I got to pull out that nugget you said viral. So I'm a critical success factor then of of how well the branding is going then is how – how viral you're going or if it's supporting going viral because 
the light bulb went on when you said that. I mean, that that's what everybody mm-hmm. seems to want to attain is viral, which, you know, translates to free marketing and wide exposure. Right. Right. Well, see, viral is an interesting thing. So if we had a graph up, viral is obviously you're here or you might be here and then you spike, right? Mm-hmm. But with every spike is a, is a decline. So usually that viral thing is a spike and then it's going to decline. But the whole goal is to decline higher than, than where you started, right? So you've increased X amount of followers and X yeah, amount so of it, customers. It, over the long term, you get a slight, you get a bump up and maybe slow down the decline. And uh, mm-hmm. yeah, every viral, I guess, does come to an end. Yeah. And look, with some virals, some people can actually hit lower than when they started um, because people have had enough of it and they've all decided to disappear and go away and they just didn't like how it turned out at the end or they've had enough because they saw it too much. And then it's like, oh, that's a problem. So with every up, there's always a down and and you you can't forget that. What we care about is steady growth. So steady growth with press and media, you know, it's about the media placements you're getting. It's about others. Are you getting higher media placements and better positioning with better media outlets? It's it's viral plus building that foundation up every year. You've got to have growth. Yeah, you've got to have, mm -hmm, you've got to have steady growth. Um, that's important. Even with viral opportunities, there still has to be a steady growth line. Um, and right. again, when you're seeing a graph go, you know, sort of straight across and then up and then dip all the way back down and then sort of come up and then straight and then all the way, that's not a consistent frame. There's something yeah. wrong there. So and you've it- got to be able to tap into that graph and, and help it just go up. Steady growth is always um, an an amazing thing to achieve for, for any is it, is it is it hard to measure how effective branding is and how, oh, you know so hard oh you know, man it's so hard i would look and at I that as like, being like the challenge <laughs> it's so hard because it's everywhere and there's not one dashboard that brings in right. you know press social media metrics um if you're an artist it's radio it's streaming like there are some really awesome software services out there but they they don't bring it all in and you know that's kind of the next thing i've been working on is how i i tried i you know as a magazine (laughs) i would i would try to figure out a way how do you how do you measure all the channels and it's just i I just couldn't get there it was too i mean your website yeah your website which people forget today is still of number one importance right it is more important than Instagram. It is more important than TikTok. It is more important than social media. And people have absolutely forgotten about that. Not everyone, but a lot. The website is the best way to monitor that growth because obviously people are hitting your page. That You're seeing where they land. You're seeing how long they land for. You're seeing how long they stay through your website. Where are they going? And you own that information, okay? You own it. And then if you know how to turn that, turn those statistics back into marketing ideas and plans to to reignite sales and happy days. I can uh, kind of of encapsulate this this principle here. So what you have all your different ways of branding that you're, you're, you're trying to get promotion on all those different channels, but they should consistently then in one way or the other be driving you to the website, which can then be measured more closely. Always always and you own everything because like if your account gets shut down tomorrow on a tiktok or whatever um right. you lose everyone you lose everyone you know one can shut your website down except you and you wouldn't do no. that so you know that's really really important is to drive them back and then the question today is yeah how to drive them back what makes it interesting um, you mm-hmm. know, how to get them to go back there. And again, merchandise and, and e-commerce sales are a big driver of that or releasing releasing something to your website back in the old days, you know, like right. exclusively. I guess things like that up build up buzz, show. build buzz up. and Yeah, you, you've got to own your metrics. You really do. Um, so, you know, Dead, Dead Horse Branding has its signature uh, DH7 branding formula. We've talked a little bit about that. Any other points you want to hit on that that uh, have some good lessons for people trying to build their brand? Yeah, I, I think the points are that you have to follow those seven steps. 
you have to. And the seven R first is the strategy. That's the most important. Where are you going? What are you doing? <laughs> what, what's your point? <laughs> then it's the, the logo. How does the logo reflect the brand? What are the colors? What's the vibe? What's the feel? What's the aesthetic? And then that turns into a photo shoot. How do we now put a face to this, this brand? What is that face doing? Where are you positioned? What's the location? What's the style? The, the whole thing, right? All, all imagery, including video, like everything, photography, visuals. Then it goes into your website. A lot of people like to try and do a website and then do visuals after. It's the wrong way to do it for so many different reasons, but it's got to go photos, visuals, and website. And then that website is basically the end result of that logo, those colors, that style, the aesthetic, the photos, the visuals, right? And then, of course, there's marketing drivers that have to happen in there. So once you've done your website, you know, then you move into your marketing and social media and or publicity. They're, they're formula five and six, and they flip dependent upon a couple of different things. So that can be tricky. You have to know when to flip those two around. But marketing and social media, then you're into publicity efforts, then you're into distribution and sales. And they're your seven that you have to abide by. If you want to cut the logo out, you've killed licensing and distribution over there on the seventh leg. You've killed it. So, you know, why, why, why would you do that? Um, and then if you want to cut out a website, Again, you've, you've, you've broken, you've broken it. So the biggest challenge we find with any brand is the lack of business knowledge and business sense, you know? So those seven formulas are the strategic brand build or product build that you have to abide by. And they have to be working together constantly. Now, the strategy is always going to move the logo, not so much. Like, hopefully, you don't have to change your logo too many times. Hopefully, you get it right the first time, or if not, at least the second. Um, marketing, social media, press, licensing, distribution, they all have to be happening at the same time. So I always use the analogy, if it takes four wheels, you know, to drive a car and get somewhere, it takes four wheels. If you try to cut it down to three or two, it's not going to go. So just know that, just know you're putting in, you know, gas into a car that's not going to go. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I had I some, I, I had some questions on like, what are some of the key things to look at for a startup company and Brandy, but you, you know, you, you've hit those. Um, it's, you know, you've got, is there, there any other points you'd like to hit for a startup company? You talked about all the different types of yeah. marketing and making sure they're integrated in. Are there, uh, Anything else yeah. you can think of for a startup company? And then maybe also then what's something that a company should look at uh, that's more established, you know, to tweak yeah. and improve their brand? Yeah, absolutely. So for a startup company, do your strategy. Obviously, it's number one. And when you've done it, redo it and make it realistic. So a lot of people have very unrealistic strategies, very, very unattainable. Um, so you, you have to, you, you can't be afraid to, to go small. You, you can't be afraid to go small. And once you nail small, you can keep going up. Right. But if someone's got such a big ego, like for instance, we had, we had some clients come to us several years ago and they basically sat in front of us and said, okay, we want to make a million dollars in eight weeks. Now tell me how to do and, that. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, oh, okay, what product do you have? And how are sales going? Oh, we don't have anything. Are you, you like not even a brand? Nope. We just, that's what we're going to make. We're going to manifest it and we're going to make it. And we're going to do it together. And I was like, mm -hmm, there's the door. I think that's what that you were talking with. about with lacking business sense or business. A hundred percent. Like so unrealistic. Now, if we had a realistic time frame. That would be great. But most importantly, does your strategy of the industry that you're in even allow you to get there in that time frame, right? Because if you are a, unfortunately, 55 plus female trying to make it in the pop scene, wanting to be a pop artist and wanting to make a million dollars in say two years, it's still unrealistic, right? 
So those strategies ha- have to, and it's such an unfortunate thing to say out loud, but those strategies have to make sense and they have to tie into the demographic. Have to be like and so. why, yeah, and why would that not necessarily matter? Why would a 55 plus year old not make it in the pop scene in two years and want to make a million dollars? So you're telling me and, I can't be a pop singer now, huh? <laughs> no, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, well, thanks for but breaking it, the bad news to me. <laughs> down, that's okay, but it, it comes down to the consumer, right? So it's all cool that you want to do that, but who's your consumer yeah. and are they going to pay for that? And we know that pop music is a very young consumer, so you need to be like, I don't know, the coolest 55 plus. You need to be arriving at 18 or something. Year um, old. Yeah, exactly. you, you mentioned also like one thing is, is is to put a strategy together, but then redo the strategy. So is that mm-hmm. like you say, it makes it more realistic then or you, you'll absolutely that? it's like packing a suitcase to go overseas. You pack it and you think you need everything. And then you're like, all right, I'll, I'll sit on it for two days and I'll, I'll go back through it. And then you realize I don't need this seventh swimwear, you know, a bikini. I don't need 700 pairs of shoes. Um, so <laughs> and I've had to do it and it works, um, because you get very excited in that initial strategy and, and then you really need to come back to it and go, okay, yeah, that might not happen. Don't concentrate there. And even in our daily work environment, when we're, you know, going to war and I say going to war for brands and talent, because it sometimes it feels like you're absolutely battling it out in a battlefield. And I mean, people can get nasty out there. Um, yeah, I heard the entertainment industry, industry can get pretty vicious. <laughs> man, some people are just crazy, absolutely crazy. I mean, you know, there's something to be, there's a whole conversation on, on the mental health and, and well being there as well. But, um, well, it's so ego, it's so thing. ego driven, it's so oh, egocentric man. that it's just, uh, it's a yeah. breeding ground for that kind of dysfunction. It, it absolutely is. But even even when you've got that strategy in place and, and you're, you know, really going at it for your client, it's really important that even us as a team are realistic about what we go after first. Because again, you want to see growth. You know, if if we're if we're shopping a, a new treatment around for a documentary or a movie and we're attaching talent, you know, you've got your A list talent, you've got your B list talent, you've got your C list talent. Like start with the C, build it, like get interest, get people on, then move for the B, then move for the A. Happy for you to even maybe look in some C's and try for an A. But again, it's all about time management and where it's best spent. So the lower hanging fruit obviously is always going to be. Something I've learned just been talking to you about branding. It's really important to be realistic um, that there's that, I guess your egos get in the way and you, and, you're not realistic with what your brand can do, but that you yeah. um, need to have some realism to it to be mm-hmm. able to then use that brand to achieve good marketing results. Yeah. And look, we, we have out of the world, crazy ideas all the time that we're not afraid to try. And, and we will include in the plan because you got to dream and you got to shoot for the stars a hundred percent. But mm-hmm. there is a percentage in which that should align. So right. the realisticness, you only know the realisticness of something if you've been through it, right? You can only make that ratio judgment call if you've been in the thick of it. You got to you really walk hard. the road. You got to walk it to know what. I mean, it's really hard to be a, a fresh artist on the scene going, well, why can't I be Taylor Swift in a month? Like, why not? Right. And it's like, okay. And I always say there's a fine line to all of our clients. There is a fine line between educating you right and basically working for you there is a fine line because everyone that comes on in any sense with most firms like they want to know how to do everything and it's like okay i i can't teach you how to do what i do all i can really do is suggest this this and this and why but if you sometimes you know they, they just want hours and hours of your time to just understand how it all works you know like i you need to sign up for a class if, if, you know, yeah, it kind of gets back to that class. ego <laughs> having to deal with those, um, with those egos. Well, I mean, we had a pretty good discussion yeah. here on branding. Are there any additional points you'd like to about building up a better brand? You know, I'm going to quote Damon John, cause I, I think he's awesome. And he, 
I had the opportunity to have a consultation with him way back and he said something very awesome that he has said publicly before, but I love how he says, you know, build everything. Like when you go on to build something, build it on the down low, like build it in privacy, build everything in privacy. And when it is ready and it's got some momentum and it's, you, you've hit those low hanging fruits, like then you, you really go to it. And there's so much to be said about that because you get to, you get to experience what you're trying to put out there. You get to make sure and, and test it, right? You road test it. I mean, you don't build a race car and then, you know, go in the, you know, V8 supercar massive championship the next day. Like you got to test it on the road. You got to drive it. You got to get some drivers in there. You got to feel it out, fix all the kinks. So uh, I think what he said was awesome. And, you know, definitely being realistic about those strategies and ask, ask well, I want to ask a question back you. on, is, is it something where you can hurt yourself if you've developed a brand, you don't do enough testing with it. And then you Absolutely. put it out and it, it's not Absolutely. the right approach. Does that make it even, it sounds like for branding, oh. you've really got to be extra focused on testing mm -hmm. what you're doing. Absolutely. Once it's out there, it's out there. Very hard to pull it back. Okay. Very hard to pull it back. And we're so quick to judge online because we can. Um, and again, hate to say it, but we can. And sometimes we can't undo images from our mind. Right. So right. absolutely test it. But the biggest thing, and this is what I just wanted to say, was absolutely ask your peers and people around you for advice and feedback. However, bear in mind, you know, are they the right customer? Are they the right consumer? Well, they, do, they, do they understand the direction that's, you're trying to take things mm -hmm. in? Because that's, that's a big thing. And then, look, some people are going to hate your brand. That's normal. Not everybody likes the word dead horse branding. Like I've had some people call up and be like, what are you doing to horses? You know, I forgot to bring that up earlier on in the intro, but uh, I think it's a great name, phrase, but what I found great about it, you don't forget it. Um, you know, like the podcast yeah. press releases were coming through and I was scanning through it. I, where's that dead horse <laughs> branding? <laughs> yeah. And it, right? it, has, it has a mental connection. Mm -hmm. And some people don't really know what it means. And, and that's okay. I mean, what does Apple mean? Um, mm -hmm. But it's, it's stop beating a dead horse, like stop hitting your head up against a wall and, and come and see us and let us help you. And then as the co-founder of the company, Rick would say is it's all about the branding is about building, building on, on skeletal bones. Right. It, it all well, now I know <laughs> Beat a dead structure. horse and skeletal bone. I just thought it was a cool there name. You go. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I think I think that would be some of the best takeaways. And and again, just for anyone that's starting a home business or wants to go out on their own or, or be an entrepreneur, if you don't have the fire in your belly, if it's not do or die for you, I don't know if I'd bother because yeah. it is a massive slug. And if you don't have that fire to get up every day and that energy and that determination, um, I just wouldn't want to put anybody in so much heartache and so much stress because it's extremely stressful yeah, being talking an about those, those It is 90, not easy. That 90 hours a week we were talking about early in the podcast. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of like the audience, my favorite question for the audience is like, what is one thing a podcast listener should do tomorrow morning to uh, start building a better brand? Put on another episode of the Home Business Podcast. Oh, <laughs> that's what they should do. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, listen, every every morning, every every the best thing to start your day, I feel, I honestly feel, is in silence. It is a time where you can process. It is a time where you can think. It is a time where you can set yourself up for the day. You can make those mental goals. And then when you have your morning coffee and get into it and go or you're getting the kids to school, whatever it is you're doing, then you can figure out what podcast you might want to listen to, what influence you might want to listen to. But I remember having this conversation. I was about 20. It's when I first came to Nashville. I was 20 turning 21. And I met a dear friend and mentor. And we had this full 
conversation about how there is a difference between like downtime on your own, like just having like quiet time or downtime on your own, like where you're just not even thinking, right? You're watching a movie, you're in your own element, but you're not processing life or experiences or anything. It's just downtime. It's just mm-hmm. I'm, I'm in my own world and I'm just doing things by myself. So that is your, your self downtime. But then there is your self processing time where we don't always want to go there, right? Every time you get a minute by yourself or whatever, you do want to put on a movie, binge out, order a pizza. Like you kind of want to take your mind away, but you have to think of that downtime as split in the middle of yourself. Do that, order your pizza, hang out, take your mind away, but you've got to balance it out. You've got to process and you've got to think about things and did that work? What do I want now? Check so it's, it's kind of like more about having reflection where you're, where, where you're reflecting Absolutely. and you're not looking at to-do lists, but you're kind of seeing the, the bigger t- picture before your mind starts mm-hmm. chattering and you get lost in the task. But to uh, yep. maybe that yep. kind of- And I don't mean it. meditation. I don't mean meditation because again, that is to take your mind away. That is to, that is to like, that is just to lift you out of a space, right? Reflection to your point and or what I call processing is to like literally go within and mm-hmm. digest as much as you can for that day in that moment. Think about how to fix things, shift things or appreciate what you've done right. and then go on for the day. Well, we've kind of reached the end of our branding journey here today on today's podcast. Are there any final points you'd like to share? I think we're good. Oh, well, great. Um, Melissa Corcabaya, <laughs> thanks for joining us today on the Home Business Podcast. Thanks I've, for having me so much. It's been great. Thanks. I mean, uh, I've definitely, I've definitely learned a lot and I kind of look at, I think I have more of a systematic feeling about branding where, Mm -hmm. you know, it's not just that visual image, but it's how you work Mm -hmm. all the different elements of your, your marketing together and attain a branding. So um, I can't think of anything that's more fundamentally important to business success than uh, the brand that you're projecting. So thank you for Mm -hmm. joining me today. You're welcome. To learn more about Melissa Corcobayo and Dead Horse Branding, I love that name, please visit deadhorsebranding.com or our podcast website for more information on, on guests. Thanks for joining us today on this episode of the Home Business Podcast. Share your feedback with us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, at our website, homebusinessmag.com. Subscribe to our newsletter. For more information, visit homebusinessmag.com or the homebusinessexpo.com. I'm Richard Kavanagh saying anchors away. We'll talk with you soon. Until then, make it a better branded home base day. Thank you for watching Home Business TV.